Let's open our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. And what we're looking at is the salvation that all of us are here saying that we possess or we're interested in. Either you're here because someone brought you because they want you to know about the Lord, or you're here because you know him. But I often think about what it is that, that I'm a dispenser of. I'm a dispenser of this. I can go anywhere in the world, and I do go many places in the world, and I tell people that there's nothing like what we have that's offered anywhere else. We offer people freedom from guilt. We offer people freedom from ever feeling condemned again the rest of their life. They don't have to ever, if someone's looking at them, feel like, oh, they know what I did and I'm in trouble. We can dispense the only antidote for hopelessness. We have a world that our population of hopeless people declines every day because they end their own lives. We dispense the only antidote for hopelessness. There's a whole group of, of less able and elderly people that ab absolutely feel useless. They say, I don't know what I'm here for. I don't know why. I just have, I'm useless. Loneliness. I just read a piece on the mega cities of the world. It says that you can be surrounded by, surrounded by 25 million people like Mexico City or 30 million people like Tokyo, surrounded by tens of millions of people and feel absolutely alone. Did you know that we have the only cure for loneliness? There's a lot of other things you can do to distract yourself, but we have the only cure when you get adopted into God's family, he said, you're never alone again. You can't be alone. I, I travel with you. I, lo, I am with you, what? Always. And I will never, what? Leave you. See, we can't be lonely. Uh, sometimes we kind of wish, you know, that he wasn't so close because, you know, sometimes we, get, we feel bad about how we behave, but he says, you're never alone ever again. Fear. We, we are the only ones that know how to remediate fear. Frustration. God says you can have a frustration-free life with me. Wow. I remember I used to sell Preparation H. That was a hard sell. <laughs> Do you know how great it is to go out and dispense this? Everybody wants this. This is unbelievably needed. So, as believers, we're looking at the helmet of salvation. We're in the second piece, uh, or the second look at this fifth piece of armor. There are six of them. We're in number five, and this is our second look at it, and what we're looking at is why we can't really ever feel guilty again, or condemned, or hopeless, or useless, or lonely, or fearful, or frustrated, but it only works when we wear that helmet of salvation. So that's that's uh, the, the big picture. Basically this. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that this helmet of salvation is the constant reminder of what Christ did. In fact, every piece of the armor is. Christ is the truth that we have to belt onto our life. Christ is the righteousness that we wear. Christ becomes our peace that shods our feet. Christ is the one that introduces us to the Father who shields our lives and absorbs all of Satan's fiery darts. And Christ is our salvation. But this is about our identity, whether we identify with him and allow him to do what he promised to do. What did he promise to do? He says, if anybody's in me, he doesn't say if you join the church or if you get baptized or if you make a decision or whatever. He says you actually have a supernatural process of being in me. This morning there's only two kinds of people in the world. Those that have the Son and those that don't. Those that are in Christ and those that are not. Those that are saved and those that are unsaved. Those that are found by Christ and have become his sheep and those that are lost. Christians and, and unsaved people. There's only two groups of people. Those that are in Christ, Jesus has promised he's going to make us a new creation. Everything is changing. The old things are gone, and everything is becoming new in our lives. That's our identity. What's the reality? Well, we still struggle with all those things. Why? Because we're not obeying the command of putting on this armor, this helmet of salvation. 
Well, we have an amazing new identity in Christ. And basically, the Bible says this. When Jesus described how you could pick out a family member of his, he identified us as the ones that he gave abundant life to. And that life is so full, you can't hold it in. We become walking fountains of his grace. Out of us flow rivers of water. I just, the plane I was stuck on for two hours that my children, actually it was a lot more than two. I mean, they, I was supposed to go to Kalamazoo and they sent me and Chicago was having more problems and my patient children waited for hours and hours for me wondering where I would come in and it was exciting. But where I was was in New York and I was at Word of Life and I wish I could talk about Word of Life this morning. It's, it's amazing what God is doing around the world, just like we see here. I mean, it's just going on all over the world. But, but for one little brief time, at Word of Life, Bonnie asked me if I would help her. I said, oh, I'd love to help. She said, you sure? I want to buy something with a coupon. And I have two of them. I want you to do one, I'll do one. I said, oh, okay. I don't like to shop. She said, please. I said, yes. So she said, now, it's real complicated. You have to have the app, and you have to have the coupon. You have to use my code and everything. It was at Macy's. I mean, Macy's. They overcharge for everything, and then they go half price sales, and then they give you a coupon for 60% off, 20% off, 10%. In other words, they paid me to buy something. That's what I've you know, that's what it was like. So I went to the first store with my little article, I mean the desk, to check out with my little article, and I put the coupon on, and I got my app out, and I said, my wife sent me to do, she said, I know, men don't like this. I said, I don't. So I said, I'm here. And so she, beep, you know, and starts, beep, 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 I mean, all this stuff, I mean, it was four minutes of, and I was watching the screen that went from this massive price down Pretty soon I thought it was going to go negative and they'd pay me. I was watching it go down on the screen, and all of a sudden the screen flicked off. Black screen. And she looked at me and she said, Sir, I'm so sorry. This cash register just shut off by itself. She said, I am so sorry you've waited so long. She said, would you ever consider going to another? I said, oh, yeah. I said, God's never in a hurry, and I'm not. So I picked up my little article, you know, and all my coupons and my, you know, and I set it on the next one. I stood there. She started again. Beep, 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 you know, and all then get your phone out and give your blood type, whatever all they wanted, you know, for all the coupon stuff. And, and I was watching, and it got down as low as it got the last time, and it went off a second time. The second cash register at Macy's, I mean, they might be great on parades, but they were having a problem with their cash registers. And she just, it, it, she looked in agony, and she actually stepped back a little bit. I almost felt like she thought I was going to punch her or something. And I was just smiling there, and, and she said, Sir, would you ever consider moving to a third cash register? I said, I have nothing else to do. I'm doing this because I love my wife, and yes. And so I walked over, and I set my stuff down, and she got there, and before she started, she looked up at me, and she said, are you religious? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not religious. But she wondered what I was going to do there. Uh, I said, I do teach the Bible. And I said, has anybody ever explained the Bible to you? Oh, she said, I go to St. you know, somebody's, and she said, no. She said, I go to the services, though. I said, well, I would like to get you started in a personal Bible study. I went right through the gospel track. She said, oh, thank you for bringing that up. We can't bring that up. I said, I didn't bring it up. You did. You asked me if I was religious, but I didn't want to discourage her. But all that to say, did you know that if you just live the way we're supposed to live, people will notice? because we live contrary to human nature and culture if you're in Christ. We have this abundant life, and Jesus identified us as his children, the ones who have endless life, who have endless joys, who have never-ending security, and our identity is, is so solidly in Christ, we don't have to try and copy someone else to feel like we fit in. Jesus identified us by so many superlatives. He said, we are those who never hunger, who never thirst, who are never alone, who never perish, who never die, who are never lost, who will never walk in darkness. Lots of nevers. All said by Jesus. Now what does that mean? It means that we're supposed to live out. Putting on the helmet is reaffirming what God says salvation is all about. And what's so important is a lot of us know this identity but we're not really 
reminding ourselves, as you probably heard, and preaching the gospel to ourselves. The helm of salvation is not getting saved. It's understanding what salvation means. It's believing what God did. It's using the benefits of being saved. That's what the helmet is all about. It's identifying with who we belong to and then living out everything he's given to us. And we're, so, we're commanded not to get saved, but to act like we're saved, to believe we're saved. That's what that helmet means. Wearing that helmet means acting, feeling, and operating like you're really saved, like you're no longer enslaved by sin, no longer walking in darkness, no longer reflecting the ways of our old father, the devil. We have been transformed. But you know, sometimes we lose track of our new identity in this salvation that we're supposed to be putting on every day. And basically what happens is Christians get into this state of neglecting their new identity. They neglect to reaffirm and believe and begin choosing to operate on the truth that saved us. Remember, as you receive the Lord, you walk therein. The same way we heard the gospel truths and we reached out and embraced them for ourselves, believing on them, which turned out to be believing on him and he transforms our life. That's the same way we live every new day. It's almost like we reaffirm everything that happened and we allow him to be unleashed in our lives. Well, when we don't protect our minds by wearing that helmet and when we don't have the hope of our salvation, what happens, to use a, a term, is our new identity gets hacked. Now, you know, that's big time, hacking. I mean, we've seen just in the last two weeks, you know, the hacking of uh, a major political party and the hacking, I mean, the IRS has gotten hacked and compromised all this stuff. And there's all kinds of stuff that's going on. We know about that. In fact, uh, at the meeting I was at this week, there was someone from uh, Dayton from the big Air Force base there who is a part of our hypersonic program in America. And he said when the Chinese just released their picture of their hypersonic vehicle, he said it was actually our picture that they hacked and they uploaded it. That's how good they are. They have gotten into the U.S. Air Force's most sensitive things, hacking their way in, and they actually have extricated the building plans and all the details for our hypersonic vehicle. See, that's hacking is really popular, but when we get hacked, we, got, we start getting robbed of our joy and peace. That means we start acting like everybody else around us. We start going with the flow. We lose our security. We lose our confidence. We lose our spiritual hunger. We lose that boldness that causes us to stand up for Christ, speak up for Christ, call others to follow Christ. It has to be boldness from God for us to go to someone and say, I don't think you're wearing your shoes of peace. You're anxious all the time. I don't think you're wearing the breastplate of righteousness. You seem to be living like an unsafe people. That takes boldness. We lose that. Neglecting the truths of salvation confuse us, paralyze us, and lead us into periods of what could be called, now here's another term, Spiritual identity theft. Now, you all know what identity theft is. I mean, what is it, seven million Americans a year get their identity stolen and someone opens cards in their name and someone gets debts in their name and they can even, you know, get your income tax refund. That's what the IRS has been sending letters out for, that millions of people have had their record at the IRS compromised and, and they're trying to reset your PIN or someone else is going to get your refund and all that. But what's spiritual identity theft. When we don't wear that helmet, it leads born-again believers to look and act and feel lost. That's what it is. They no longer act like Christians. They no longer operate like Christians. They don't behave like Christians. That's spiritual identity theft. Because every moment of every day, the world and our flesh and the devil conspire to try and steal our true identity by obscuring the truth of salvation that is resident in our minds as we believe and hold and operate on truth. Paul told the dear saints at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5.8 that the helmet of salvation protects our hope of salvation, our holding on to and operating 
on the truths of salvation, and the helmet protects that. What exactly is the hope of salvation? It's the assurance that what God promised, he does. He said, I will never condemn you. He said, you can boldly come to my throne of grace and mercy, Hebrews 4. We know we've been completely cleansed and forgiven, Hebrews 10. So, how do we understand the helmet of salvation? Well, one chapter. Now, I thought this is kind of fun. If you're in one of my 52 greatest chapters of the Bible study, this is one of the chapters. And so I'm going to show you a typical what we do. So everybody open your Bibles to Romans 8. Very familiar, very crucial, very vital chapter of the Bible. And we're going to read the first verse, the 28th verse, and the last two verses. Okay, so four verses out of this whole chapter, which this is one of those chapters in the Bible that all the points are clearly introduced. And there are three points to Romans 8. The first point is that if you are in Christ, you'll never be condemned, flat out, no condemnation. If you are in Christ, he's sanctifying you and me, so we'll never be frustrated. Every time we want to do something and it gets thwarted, it is God saying, I know more than you, and I want to change you to be more useful to me, so I am frustrating your plans and putting on top of it my plans. You know, my plan was to, you know, left Albany at 4.30 a.m. yesterday morning and is to be home before noon. That was my plan. But God had other plans, and we can go through life with no frustration if we surrender to his plan, not our own. And finally, we're never separated from him. So let's read about that. You found it? Let's all stand together for the reading of God's word. You follow along in your Bibles. I'm going to read 1, 28, and 30. 8 and 39. Number one, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. How do you know you're in Christ? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So that's the first one. No condemnation. Romans 8 opens with no condemnation. It continues with verse 28. No frustration. Why? Because we know that all things work together for good. Actually, the operative word there is, it isn't neutral, it's, and we know that God causes all things to operate together for his good. See, the, it's not my good. See, I, I want to be comfortable and convenient and convenient life and secure life. God says, no, no, no. I am working all things together for good, my good, God's good, to those who love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose. I am called for the purpose of glorifying God. And he's going to shape and, and sand and scrape and, and chisel me until I'm most useful. You know, Michelin, there's a big deal going on at the Uffici Gallery in Italy, the most famous one in Italy. And there, you know, the, the big statue of David is there. And did you know when Michelangelo got that, it was a beautiful block of stone that was great. But he chipped away most of it. And inside that stone was the priceless image of David, the young David. But only by all that work chipping away did he get that perfect representation. That's what God's doing with us. He said, don't be frustrated. I'm making you into a masterpiece tool useful to me. But don't be frustrated, because I am going to sanctify out of your life everything that's not useful. Now look at verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Paul summarizes the doctrine of salvation as saying, you're entering into a relationship with God, he'll never condemn you, you don't have to be frustrated with anything in life, and you'll never be separated from the one who loves you and me more than we can even comprehend. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you teach us how and why we need that helmet of salvation on all day long, every day and consciously start our day putting on again the truths of our salvation. In your precious name, we ask for you to open our minds and help us to respond today. 
Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, basically what I'm saying is that Christianity is that we're never condemned, never frustrated, never separated. That's the summary that Paul gives after giving all the doctrines of the, the doctrines, the seven doctrines of salvation. But each of these facets of salvation, defined by the doctrine of salvation, are the keys to walk through life confidently. See, you're confident if you know you're never going to be condemned. That, that people can remind you like they did Paul, that you killed my uncle, Paul, and he says, yep, I was the chiefest of sinners. I did kill your uncle and your aunt and probably your cousins too because I was the chiefest of sinners, but I found mercy and grace from the Lord. See, Paul never said, oh, I didn't do that. You know, it's kind of like this unfolding Olympian thing. I mean, every day we get a new version of the story of what happened at the gas station with our famous medalists, you know. God doesn't do that. God says that I have a purpose for you, and my purpose is that if you confess your sins to me and agree that you're a sinner, I wipe out the penalty and the record. And anybody can come to you and say, you did that, and you say, yes, I did that. But Jesus forgave me. That's why, remember when uh, John Newton, John Amazing Grace Newton, remember him? Uh, the, the great hymn writer in the court of, the, of royalty in, in England, he got Alzheimer's. Most people don't. I mean, what a fascinating. I mean, he was suffering from what, what, what we would call advanced Alzheimer's. He spent the last two years of his life in bed. They couldn't let him out. They kept him locked in the room. And they let everybody come visit him, though. And people used to line up all day long, and they'd walk through. They wanted to meet the amazing grace guy. And he would be in bed and... He would smile at him, and he said, he said the same thing all day long. I don't know who I am, and I don't know who you are. But I was a great sinner, and Jesus is a great Savior. And he'd smile, and they'd leave, and he'd go, well, I don't know who you are. I don't know who I am. But I was a great sinner. Boy, he had one track on his mind. He knew that Christ had forgiven him. That's all, to the end. No condemnation. No frustration. Did you know he could lay in that bed for two years and witness for Christ? And that was God's plan. No longer a ship captain, no longer a famous man, a sick old man dying. No frustration. Useful to God. Never separated from his love. The summary of the helmet could be stated as a series of declarations of why we can never really ever feel guilty or condemned or hopeless or useless or lonely or fearful or frustrated ever again. This is ours if we wear the helmet. So what does it mean to wear the helmet of salvation? If, if I keep saying that, I've said it several times, before we go, because it's almost time to go, what does it mean to wear the helmet? Well, what it means is taking the, the big words, the big doctrines of salvation and, and embracing them. I used to have a secretary. She was an amazing secretary. I have many amazing, I still have amazing, but she was unique. And uh, her uncle was the superintendent of the Assemblies of God International. And just, she was such an amazing person. I didn't know that when, I mean, I knew she was AG, but I didn't know her skill set. When we, I just thought she knew how to type. And I started noticing the counseling load started diminishing over the years. Finally, I said, uh, Renee, what's going on? And she said, well... She says, all those people are waiting out, you know, for you, and you're in there talking to them. So I turn to them and I say, what, what did you come here? What are you seeking? And immediately when they told me, she said, I put out my hands and I quote verses to them and pray over them. By the time they got into my office, they said, I'm fine. I don't need any help, you know. And, and they just kept walking through. And finally I asked one of them, what's going on? And they says, ask her. And so she was amazing. But basically... There was another secretary that wasn't amazing, and she, when we read the Bible, she would never say any of these words. She'd always say, hard word, hard word, uh, you know, justification, hard word, reconciliation, hard word. She, I mean, every other word in the Bible is hard to her. Let's talk about the hard words, okay? Because I'm forgiven, I never have a reason to feel guilty. I have been, if someone serves their time for their crime, they walk out of there, no one can ever condemn them for it because the government decided their time, they served it, they're done. It's over, whether you like it or not. Better than that is, Jesus Christ offered the miracle of forgiveness. He absolutely looked at people and said, 
I forgive you. And you are cleansed. You have total forgiveness. Now, how did he do that? He absorbed their guilt. He took their sin, held it. God poured out his wrath on that sin like Jesus committed it. And he bore the entire weight of the punishment for that sin in himself. That's the only way he forgives anybody. He is punished like he did what we did. Then he offers to us forgiveness. And, and because of that, I don't have to feel guilty about those sins. He felt the guilt for them. He felt the pain. He felt the punishment. He felt the separation. He felt the ignominious hatred of God in that wrath against sin. God hates sin and always punishes it. And all the sins that are put on Christ, God puts it on him. So we don't have to ever feel guilty. Justification is the, the larger picture of that, how forgiveness operates. I never have any reason to feel condemned because Jesus was condemned in my place. Jesus took my place. That's what justification means, but that's only half of it. For he hath made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin, my sin, for us. That we might, that's only half. That's half of justification. Jesus bearing my sin in his own body on the tree. The other half is that we might become the righteousness of God. We, we become saints. We don't have to feel guilty or condemned. We're saints. Paul said to the people in Corinth, he says, some of you were effeminate and abusers and all this horrible moral wickedness, but you are sanctified, but you are justified, but you are washed. See, that's the wonder of forgiveness and justification. I never have to feel guilty or condemned again. And, and I remember when I used to preach in the jails, and we'd go to Gaffney, and I forget all the places down south we'd go, and it was the kind of bad jails where they, they didn't let you get up near the bars because they didn't want them to, you know, get you. And so they had a little barrier, and we would preach to them in the cells, and it was so interesting. You could look at any of those men behind bars and say, you're convicts, I'm a convict. You sinned, I've sinned. You never have to be guilty or feel condemned for what you did if you'll let Christ bear your guilt and your condemnation. And you'd get about one out of a hundred that all of a sudden as you're speaking, they'd look at you. They'd say, what did you just say? See, they were hearing the gospel for the first time, some of them. Regeneration, this is our entrance into God's family. Adoption is not how we enter God's family, it's how we get the benefits of God's family. Regeneration is the entry point. I never again have any reason to feel hopeless. Why? Because because I'm regenerated, I have an endless series of new beginnings. Isn't that amazing to think about? It's kind of like one of those, do you remember those etch-a-sketch things? You could mess it up and then you just went. It was all gray again. And you could mess it up some more. It's like the beach with the ocean. You can mess the sand up all you want. Wave after wave comes. It makes it perfect again. And that's what regeneration is. The washing of regeneration and the renewing. It's the endless new beginnings. So I never have to feel hopeless. I never have to say, oh, I failed for the however manyth time. And so I'm hopeless. That, that I'll never get over that. You say, no, no. I have an endless, endless offering of new beginnings because I've been regenerated. Redemption, I don't have to feel useless. Why? Because I was bought at a price to glorify God. I even know why I was bought. I was bought to serve and glorify and fulfill, as David did, God's purposes for me. There's something that only I can do in God's plan, and that's what he's asked me to do, and nobody else can do it. And I'm supposed to go through life fulfilling his purpose, and the same is true for each of us. That's what's so neat. We've all been bought at a price to glorify God, and, and he put us in a specific place with some unchangeable features in a certain time in history with all the dynamics that make up our family and everything about us for a purpose. And therefore, I never have to feel useless. Reminds me, you know, if you know Ed Boss, you've probably heard him tell the story of, 
of uh, Wycliffe. And Ed was going through the kitchen once, and there was a man with his rubber gloves on washing the pots and pans, and he said, what do you do here? And the guy says, I translate Bibles into 8,000 languages, and we're at 4,200, and we have about 3,800 left. Why? And Ed just weeps. He said, that man realized you don't have to be in a mud hut in Papua New Guinea or wherever to, to be on the front lines. If he didn't wash the dishes at the Jars Wycliffe headquarters, they couldn't be out there doing what they do because he wasn't called to translate. He was called to help translate. And so we're never useless because we've been redeemed uh, we can be the ones receiving those babies like receiving Jesus across the counter or having them dropped off in our room, you know, in, in one of the youth ministries. And Jesus said, if you do what I call you to do, you'll never lose your reward. And then we're adopted, and this word adoption is very interesting. It's the fact that we have been welcomed into God's family, not as a baby. This is the baby. We were born. And, and remember what the, the truth of a baby is. A baby has no past, only a future right? That's why we're born again. We start with no past and only a future. But when we are adopted, we're fully taken in with all the rights of adulthood, of all the, 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 the like the financial, the fiduciary, everything. You're not a child under a guardian. When you are adopted, you get full-blown inheritance. And that's what our, our inheritance is, that we become the habitation of God. I mean, there's this guy, a British guy, Geoffrey Bull was his name, that was captured by the Red Chinese in China, or I mean in Tibet in 1950, and they were rounding up all the missionaries, and they put them all in solitary confinement. And they kept them in little cubes where it was, the light never changed, they never did anything except stay in that cube, they never heard a sound, and a little door would open once a day and a little pie pan of mush would come in and they'd eat it and they had a little hole in the corner and that's it. And most of the people went crazy. That's what solitary confinement does. And after two years, they brought him out and they said, how did you make it? You know, he was blinking, he was all emaciated. And they said, how, how come you, everyone else went crazy? He said, oh man, he said, uh, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible and he said, I've only been in here for 730, you know, days. And he said, I've gone through 730 of the chapters of the Bible. The first day I was in here, I did Genesis 1. And I spent the entire day in silence, walking around the cell, remembering everything I could remember from Genesis 1. And he said, and I was so excited because I knew tomorrow I could think about Genesis 2. And he said, and so I made a little mark on the wall, woke up the next day, and while I was waiting for my mush, he said, I, I went back and forth and exercised myself thinking all day long about everything I could think and remember and meditate on Genesis 1 and 2. And he said, and he said, you get the idea? He said, I just got in. I'm just barely into the good stuff. And, you know, and... How would you do if one of them was Leviticus 27? What would you remember about that? Have you ever thought about that, how little most of us know about the Bible? This guy was a 30-some-year-old man of God, grown up in Sunday school, had Orawana or something, and, and had mastered the scriptures. And he said, I was never alone. He said, I had to hold myself back from thinking about tomorrow's chapter so I could look forward to doing it with the Lord tomorrow. We're never alone. Sociologists say that that's the deepest pain, loneliness. You know what loneliness is? When God takes everyone and everything else out of my life so he can be closest. Is that what you thought about last time you were lonely? Or did you crank up the music, play a game, or restlessly go wander around trying to find something to do? Instead of saying, Lord, you have taken everything and everyone else out of my life so you can be closest. I want to know you better today. That's the byproduct of being adopted. I never again have reason to feel lonely. That's why Paul sang with a beaten open back in prison. Because he wasn't alone. The Lord was there with him in the prison. I'm reconciled, another hard word, my secretary would say. I never again have a reason to fear, feel fearful. I don't have to be fearful because God is not my enemy. He's, he's friended me. Really, that, there's a term a common term, friended. God has bestowed friendship on me because I've been reconciled through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. 
and I'm reconciled to God, I don't have to be fearful because God says, if God be for you, who can be against you? And greater is he that's in you, you're not lonely, than he is in the world, so you never have to fear. And finally, sanctification is, I never again have any reason to be frustrated because God is, is orchestrating every event in my life for his glory and for his purpose. So, basically, we can run through these. Wearing the helmet of salvation's forgiveness component means we're like the woman that Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Boom. You're cleansed. And that means that we believe that. We never again have to feel guilty. Have you experienced the relief of knowing that all of your sins, all of them, are gone? If you really have, you tell people about it. You tell them, I was a great sinner. Christ is a great savior, like John Newton. How about the, the uh, justification component? What we say is because we're justified, we never have to feel condemned. Therefore, having been justified by faith, Romans 5, 1 says, we have peace with God. And, and there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We know that. Have you experienced the peace of justification? All guilt gone? Knowing that Jesus was punished enough, I don't have to punish myself. How about this regeneration, this new beginning stuff? I never have to feel hopeless. Christ died to make me vibrant and full of endless life. Have you experienced the power of an endless life? Do your neighbors know that you're going to live endlessly? Do they think of you as a fire hydrant of the water of life? I mean, do they just say, wow, you're getting me too wet with all of your overflowing life. Could you cut back a little bit? Or are they not aware that you and I have been regenerated and redemption? I never have to feel useless. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God. Have you experienced the thrill of being liberated and set free and rescued by God for a purpose? Do you check in with him every day? Say, what did you redeem me for today? What do you want me to do in the marketplace where I work or live or travel or school or whatever? You know, someone told me to go visit their mom, that she was all alone and really sad, and I got there. Every verse I quoted, she finished. Every song I started, she sang. The people that stopped in all talked to me about her, and I thought, she should come visit me, you know? You see, she, she knew she was redeemed, and she was living it out in the little room, which, by the way, was locked when I got there, and they locked it back when I left. But she didn't feel trapped. She was serving the Lord. How about the adoption component? You never have to feel lonely. We have the spirit of adoption. Have you experienced the joy of knowing you're adopted into Christ's family? And how about the reconciliation component? In Romans 5.10, it says, you were reconciled to God through the death of his son. I mean, the way we were friended by God is that he killed his son so we could become his friend. That's a pretty high price. That means that he was very serious. Christ died to take me from being an enemy to make me his friend. Have you experienced the wonder of friendship with God? Wow. And finally, sanctification. In Hebrews 10, it says, he is perfected, that means matured and shaped forever, those who are being sanctified. And he said in Romans 8, everything is working together for, for God's good. He is, he is using every, he is up in the command center bringing everything into your life, every what we would call disappointments and struggles and problems and troubles, and those are all beautiful polishing agents to, to make us more reflective of Christ. That's what sanctification is about. Christ died to take our soiled, spotted lives that always get wasted and make them clean and focused and eternally fruitful. So, are you wearing the helmet? If you're wearing the helmet, it means this. It means I never have a reason to feel guilty. I've been forever freed from every stain, no matter how deep, and every impurity, no matter how defiling it was. I'm justified. I don't need to feel condemned. Jesus took my place. He was punished for me. There's no record even that I sin. I'm regenerated. I never again have any reason to feel hopeless. I've been born again, as Ryan read to us, to a living hope. 
Everybody that's around me sees how hopeful I am. I am serving the God of endless new beginnings. I'm redeemed. I never have any reason to feel useless. I was bought at a price by God. I'm owned by him for an eternal purpose. And I'm going to live that out. I'm adopted into his family. He killed his son so I could have a spot in the inheritance. I never again have to feel lonely. I'm reconciled to God. I will never again have any reason to be fearful. God is my friend. And he promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always to the end. I'm sanctified. I never have any reason to feel frustrated. God is shaping me more every day to be useful for his purpose. Is that what people see? Do they walk up to you and say, are you religious? Because they can't figure out why you're operating unlike them. That's wearing our helmet. And we say, yep, I know Christ. I'm not hopeless. I'm not guilty. I'm not condemned. I don't feel useless. I'm not agonizingly lonely. I am the habitation of God. Can I tell you about him? That's what he left us to do. Let's all stand together. As we stand, it's time to go. And uh, as we go, it's time to wear our helmets. And if some of you are here, like at the last meeting where I just was, and I said, some of you have heard this all week, and it never will work for you because you don't know Christ. It was so neat. I had them bowed their heads and closed their eyes, and Mr. Hoodie was there. You know, this young adult wearing, I mean, he looked like, you know, Darth Vader with his face in there. You couldn't even see it was so dark. And I said, some of you are here, and you're saying, this is impossible. And I noticed the hood come back a little bit, and he started looking at me because he must have been thinking, this is impossible. And I said, did you know that Jesus Christ is here today and he can actually come and give you that new heart and transform you and take away your guilt and your hopelessness and uselessness? I said, is that something you like? And he went like this. He said, I would. I thought, oh, wait, hold back. You're not supposed to be so zealous, you know? And he called on the name of the Lord. Now, if Christianity is not working for you, it could be you're not a Christian. It only works for Christians. If you're not in Christ, you can be in Christ today. At the end of the service, there are going to be elders and our Titus II women's team will be here, and they would love to open God's Word and explain to you how you can begin or restart your identity in Christ. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for what you did so that we can be surrounded by Christ's truth, girded with his righteousness, wearing his peace through life, shielded by you, our Father in heaven, to extinguish every fiery dart, and to wear that helmet every day, reminding ourselves of what a great salvation you have given to us. I pray that all of us who know you will pull that helmet on tight, and for those that don't, they might come to Christ today. In your precious name we pray and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.